Good morning, good afternoon, and good evening, everyone, uh, depending on where you are now. This is Kakin Chuk. I'm the NNAC and Hillglad Postdoctoral Fellow in Transnational Asian Studies at the Child Center for Asian Studies at Rice University. I will be the faculty host for the webinar today. I want to take this chance to thank the Child Foundations for sponsoring the Transnational Asia Speaker Series. And I also would like to thank the faculty member, staff and student at the Child Center for Asian Studies and the Department of Transnational Asian Studies. All of them have generously helped me to make this event happen. Just a few announcements before we start the webinar today. Throughout the webinar, you are most welcome to type up and submit your questions at any time. You can do this uh, in the Q&A box on Zoom. The speaker will be given a chance to respond to your questions after the lecture. We will also live stream the talk on our center's YouTube account. Now it is my honor and pleasure to introduce our speaker today, Dr. Julie Huang. Dr. Julie Huang is an assistant professor in anthropology of development at the University of Edinburgh and a fellow at the Edinburgh Futures Institute. Dr. Huang is an anthropologist whose research focuses on social enterprise and the use of new technologies, data, and markets for poverty alleviations. Dr. Huang is the author of two books, including To Be an Entrepreneur, Social Enterprise and Disruptive Development in Bangladesh, published by Cornell University Press in 2020, and Trice Woman of Iran, published two times in 2009 and 2014 by I.B. Torres. She recently has been elected as a British Academy and Wolfson Foundations Fellow. During this British Academy Fellowship, Dr. Huang will introduce and conduct a new research project on the everyday data practices of social enterprise in Bangladesh and Scotland. Now, may I invite all of you to welcome Dr. Julie Huang. Hello, everyone. And happy Friday as well. I'm delighted to be part of this year's Transnational Asia Speaker Series. Big thanks, um, of course, to the Chow Center um, and the whole team there, and to all of you as well for choosing to spend a Friday with me, and especially to Ka Kinchuk for the lovely invitation to be here. The topics I'll be speaking about today draw from some of the research that went into my book, To Be an Entrepreneur, that Kakin mentioned. Um, and I will also be drawing from some subsequent research that's actually still ongoing. So I'd like to start by first sharing my screen with you. And I'd like to describe a clip from an entrepreneurial training video. Um, this is one that's been shown many times in many different rooms across rural Bangladesh to various groups of young women. So the scene opens with this aerial shot of a tin roofed house in a rural village. This woman uh, in a uniform wheels a bicycle from the house's courtyard and then she moves off the screen. And then we hear a Bangla speaking voice narrating for an entrepreneur to carry out her activities successfully within the timeline. It is important that she prepares a correct daily plan by following the appropriate plan. An entrepreneur can increase her earning. Now we will see entrepreneur Mita's everyday activities and daily work plan. And then the scene fades into a black title page announcing entrepreneur's calendar. So then we return to Mita's house where four small children with backpacks approach her doorstep. And at the bottom left of the screen, there's a cartoon analog alarm clock with a wedge of time shaded in green. And the narrator starts telling us, today is Sunday, seven to 8 a.m. A few students come to study with Mita. So we see Amita approaching the porch to show cartoons on her laptop for the children. Then there's a fade out 
and Mita is now cycling near a pond. 8.45 a.m. to 10 a.m. Mita is headed towards Chotopara village where she will visit a few houses to provide assistance and sell some products. So in this way, we're brought through one to two hour increments of Mita's day, often helpfully illustrated by this shifting green wedge on the cartoon clock. Mita conducts a women's information session about the government stipend that women can claim during pregnancy, and she sells detergent packets to her group members. She tests a customer's blood glucose levels, and she conducts a farmer's session to discuss crop problems and then sells them hybrid seeds. She goes back home and from 7 p.m. she prepares printed passport photographs for aspiring migrant laborers. She then records the entire day's income, prepares her sessions for the following day, and packs up her bag with the relevant equipment so that she can go to bed precisely at midnight, all prepared for the next morning. Next, we see a yellow lined piece of paper with four columns drawn down the page. And we are again instructed, she has identified four planning elements, when it will happen, who will do it, what needs to be done, and where it will be done. The filled in sheet lists the time periods that the video narrated with the descriptions of her activities. This is how an entrepreneur can plan the daily activities for the entire week. As an entrepreneur, you should schedule your daily activities in this way and make sure not to deviate from the plan. The video then rolls credits. The trainer in the room stops the video and turns to the group of 10 young women who are slouching in their chairs with wide-eyed looks, dressed in the same uniform as Mita, with pens in hand but nothing written in their pristine notebooks. And he asks them, so what could you understand from this video? On the surface, Mita is the aspirational exemplar of successful women's entrepreneurship in rural Bangladesh. And she is indeed an inspiration from the piles of money she counts, the jewelry she wears, and the size and materials of her house. It is clear that she runs a successful business that allows her to afford these things. From the way Mita's female in-laws stay out of her way and look after all of the domestic work, how her husband helps her out with work errands, and how so many people come to her for assistance, it's clear that Mita has achieved a level of autonomy, authority, and respect among her community. These are all indicators of a status that the women in those training rooms only dream of possessing themselves one day. To the research observer, Mita and the types of programs she represents is also exemplary of the Silicon Valley style language and logics of disruptive innovation that have entered into international development practice over the last decades. Now, this concept of disruption in business circles is a valorized one. It's understood as the process of displacing established organizations, institutions, and value networks with radically improved business models and offerings. The concept's origins are with the business consultant and scholar Clayton Christensen, who termed disruptive innovation to refer to a novel idea or device or method that creates a new market by providing an alternative, lower cost product and set of values that ultimately displace an existing market with its established and often elite hierarchical values. While ideas about disruptive innovation have been primarily applied to capitalist markets in the global north, the language of disruptive innovation has also been adopted by development organizations, such as social enterprises, to refer to the ways in which their development models can provide compelling marketized alternatives to disadvantageous or regressive or so-called traditional practices in the global south. The aims often sound laudable. They focus on how innovative services and new technologies can help overturn established hierarchies that exclude the majority of the population. Institutional microfinance, for example, replaces local money lenders and challenges the banking system rule that you need financial collateral to access loans. Mobile phones and solar home systems leapfrog over the technologies of landlines and connections to the electricity grid 
giving communication and power to people excluded from these national infrastructures. So the broad aim of disruptive innovators in these development contexts is not to offer incremental improvements to existing practices and lifestyles of the poor, but rather to introduce radical game-changing business models that transform the fundamental ways in which the poor interact with markets and thereby improve their lives. The architects behind these initiatives, which include the designers of Mita's entrepreneurship program, imagine a positive cycle of disruption in which the new, the market, and the modern release people from the fetters of inefficient customary um, social practices and relationships. And you'll find instances of these visions echoing through the websites and reports produced by such companies, even if the disruptions and changes actually experienced by users and beneficiaries aren't the ones originally imagined. What usually is not considered, um, though, is the more pernicious set of effects of dislocating people from their webs of dependence without providing alternative inclusive support structures that people can rely on. A subset of disruptive innovation programs I've been following relate to the explicit positioning of women entrepreneurs as disruptive innovators in international development programs. They tend to be wildly optimistic in terms of all of the positive disruptions women are meant to achieve through the simple act of selling things. So take the example of Mita. As an information and technology entrepreneur, she's meant to bring game-changing devices to underserved areas. For example, using mobile diagnostic devices to measure health metrics, uh, and by offering telemedicine link-ups and having people rely on local doctors. By modeling her entrepreneurial persona in the meetings she hosts with adolescent girls, small farmers, and unemployed people about entrepreneurial techniques, Mita is expected to reshape non-market values and behaviors into market values and market behaviors. And on top of this, as a female leader and primary income earner in her family, she's meant to overturn gendered hierarchies in both homes and livelihoods in rural Bangladesh. And not only is she boosting the economic stability of her domestic, meaning home environment, the narrative is often that when women work, they boost the growth of their domestic, meaning national economy. When Samar Abdul Noor talks about problematization and development, it's about exactly this process by which a very specific technical solution is framed in such a way that it presents itself as the answer to a huge range of very complex and historically rooted problems. This notion of disruptive entrepreneurship is one of these technical solutions that I'll be focusing on today. So my research on disruptive women's entrepreneurship, which formed the basis for my book, involved 15 months of ethnographic immersion, participant observation and interviews that I conducted over 2013 and 2014. This talk also draws from further research conducted in 2019 by a research team composed of Hannah Geary, Grace Muller, Paige Chisholm and Jackie Bassett, who collectively conducted a further eight months of empirical research that included participant observation, interviews, and entrepreneur life story analysis. And those life stories are part of a larger set of 110 narratives collected since 2016 through the present and including through the COVID period. These life stories were elicited and recorded by a team of local research assistants. In particular, Nargis Begum, Hafiz Akhtar Rani, Sharmin Akhtar, Umaradha, Nibirita Pol, and Zirin Sultana Tonika with the coordination of Mosharraf Hussain. So this is all very much a long-term collaborative research project that spans a great number of topics. But the main question I'll be focusing on here in this talk is, what does it really mean to be an entrepreneur as a woman in Bangladesh? The idea is to get beyond the development discourse, the celebratory public-facing narratives, and the abstract theories and definitional debates, and instead find answers from within the experiences of women entrepreneurs themselves. I'll start with what it's like to be an entrepreneur 
as part of one of these uh, disruptive entrepreneurship projects. And then I'll compare it with experiences of um, ordinary entrepreneurial projects that women start for themselves. I'll set this comparative scene through three main perspectives. First, I'll examine the model of success that is held up in each type of entrepreneurship. Second, I'll look at the forms of ethical and relational behavior that underpin these models of success. Different kinds of social relations are mobilized in two kinds of projects. So I'll ask how women negotiate these relationships in their attempts to establish and maintain themselves as entrepreneurs. And third, I'll focus on the realignment of dependencies, the webs of obligation that are spun by these different kinds of entrepreneurial projects. And this will help us understand what forms of value are being generated and who are the primary beneficiaries of this produced value. And first, to make sense of the evaluations within these three perspectives, I need to zoom out and tell you a little bit more about the context of women's work in rural Bangladesh. Women's work in rural Bangladesh, both inside and outside the space of the home, is already a domain of contestation, a field of cultural struggle, and a site of control over women. So the agenda to disrupt women's existing livelihoods and social interactions, even while well-intentioned, is certainly not a neutral exercise. If a key aim of disruptive entrepreneurship is to overturn gender hierarchies and liberate women from domestic labor, then we really have to examine the conditions, relations, and values surrounding this traditional work environment to understand what any shift to a new kind of livelihood might entail. In rural areas, women often uh, provide the vast majority of domestic labor, which includes the home's physical upkeep, care of children and elders, home economic management, and processing of many agricultural products. All of this includes planning and preparing food, cleaning dishes, sweeping floors, washing clothes, looking after animals, managing microcredit loan payments, hosting guests, unhusking rice, collecting fuel, and helping family members and neighbors with all of these tasks. Sometimes women have other skills and activities such as tailoring, embroidery, share tending, livestock, applying henna designs uh, before weddings, money lending, and other such projects that they sometimes spin into income generating ventures that I'll come back to when I talk about women's non-institutional forms of entrepreneurship. By contrast, paid labor outside the home historically is considered usually shameful and often stifling of women's autonomy to state the wages that they might be able to bring home. Spending time in public places with unrelated men subjects women to increased social scrutiny, and they also often experience intensified patriarchal exploitation in their workplaces. The double burden of labor continues to fall on women who also have to keep up with the domestic work alongside their employment elsewhere. As a result of this, Many women have considered being able to work at home a pragmatic first choice and a virtuous one too. It means that they belong to a family with sufficient means that um, does not need to send its women out to find menial labor elsewhere. However, the economic reality of many poor families has led many women feeling pressured to make a separate income especially in cases when they find their fathers, brothers and husbands unemployed, incapacitated, or entirely absent. As one woman reports, my husband's business faced big losses and he became unemployed. Then he just sat at home, which forced me to take on the entire family's responsibility, where the entire family she had to take responsibility for included her mother and father-in-law, her husband's younger siblings, and her own children. But despite this take control attitude, women also encounter widespread criticism when they seek and obtain work outside the home. It is very difficult for women to work in our country because most people do not think women should be out there. We face many superstitions and stigmas. We also get obstacles from our families. 
There are many families who don't like girls to work, says Shumi, um, echoing words that I heard over and over again from many different women. Another interlocutor explains her motivations and also sacrifices when she decides to put herself out there. She says, my father returned home from Saudi Arabia after having a severe mental break and the whole family was in deep crisis. What will happen to our family now? My mother kept wailing. After listening to my mother's words, I started thinking of the ways that I could be a little helpful to my family. I've known how to sew for a while and was saving up some money for entering my school exams. On the one hand, the pain of not being able to register for the exam hurt me emotionally. But on the other hand, the state of my family worried me deeply. There was no one to support our family of six members. So I decided I would take the helm of the family. So this is the context in which interventions like Mita's entrepreneurship program appear presenting very specific models of success and promises of complete reversals of fortune for women and their families. The women in one such training room I was in were attracted to the outward trappings of Mita's success. For instance, the nice house, the deference from her in-laws, the way she wasn't heckled and harassed when she traveled between villages but they rejected Mita as a viable model to emulate. They attributed her success first and foremost to the conditions over which none of them had control. Moina's mother-in-law would never lift a hand to do any housework as long as Moina was alive. So she didn't see how she could implement the entrepreneur's daily plan alongside a full day's worth of domestic labor. Lakshmi didn't even have any other women in her household. Lily pointed out that Mita's husband provided the money for all the startup expenses, while Lily's own husband didn't even have an income. Additionally, the women criticized Mita for being selfish and only looking after her own interests. They talked about how she sat on her cash herself, how she didn't help or give respect to her mother-in-law, and how her schedule wouldn't allow her to visit her parents, sisters, or friends or to spontaneously help anyone who needed it. The trainees weren't just looking at Mita as a model of achieved success, but also as a model of behavior and relationality that they just could not see themselves undertaking. This isn't possible for us, they repeated every few minutes. They simply couldn't fathom acting in this way in their own lives without alienating their family members whom they loved and relied upon. So here's a, a picture of Mar Mita's cartoon rendering, which was used in program marketing materials to demonstrate the entrepreneur's confidence and autonomy. And funnily enough, when the women saw it, they agreed it was accurate, but for different reasons than the ones intended by the image's designers. Look at her, they said, standing alone, thinking her machines make her better than everyone else. She looks exactly like she doesn't care about anyone but herself was the gist of the subsequent commentary. The heroic individualized preneur was decidedly not the model of success that they aspired to. After the model of success against which aspiring women entrepreneurs needed to hold themselves, then came the training regimen designed to produce that transformative journey towards the model. While Mita and the many women that my research focused on are part of a specific um, set of women's entrepreneurship programs in Bangladesh, those of you who are familiar with other entrepreneurship programs elsewhere in the world may note a set of universally familiar characteristics. As Catherine Dolan and Dinah Rajak describe about a project near Nairobi in Kenya, participants are brought in to be, and I quote, acculturated into the values and virtues of maximization necessary to equip them for market enterprise, end of quote. And these are virtues that include responsibility, competition, risk-taking, timekeeping, self-discipline, calculation, autonomy, opportunism, and so on. Much more than just the technical skills of how to operate a blood pressure cuff or install a solar home lantern, 
Participants are trained through techniques such as observation and role play in the correct dis dispositions, bodily discipline and, and manner of speaking that are deemed required of entrepreneurs. So Mita's video um, is part of this reformatting training and it's followed by many other sub videos that go into quite a bit of detail about each aspect of her day from waking up at the same time each day to the importance of keeping her uniform clean and making sure to always wear it in order to set herself apart from random other women and from asking the right questions um, to potential clients in order to lead them in the direction of buying the service that she's about to offer, to keeping a precise account of absolutely every expenditure and earning that she's had that day. While these may seem completely worthwhile practices and habits, nothing wrong with them per se, the women in the training rooms interpreted them via the types of ethical and relational behavior that they implied. They saw that they would need to become a different type of person in relation to the other people in their lives the, um, in ways that they deemed were not just impossible, but also highly undesirable. Because, as we'll come to shortly, their own aspirations for achieving autonomy and respect were fundamentally social aspirations. By contrast, the Euro-American conceptualizations of autonomy and independence embedded in the relational model of this disruptive entrepreneurship program were rooted in an ideology of individualism. I'll give a couple examples of what this model means for um, prescriptive notions about how entrepreneurs should relate to others. First, uh, the prioritization of efficiency, uh, the need for time-bound action, and the strict accounting that were elevated over everything else meant that entrepreneurs could only spend a specific number of minutes with a customer instead of being able to help her out with other things or to stay and chat and listen to her problems. It meant that the aspiring entrepreneurs were unable to participate in the familiar social patterns of sharing and helping one another. Second, real earnings were determined by the temporalities of everyday living rather than the temporalities of the spreadsheets and income generating plans. Entrepreneurs seeking to establish information sessions for farmers, for instance, were repeatedly told to return after sunset once men had come home from the fields, which violated ideas about women's propriety and their own sense of security while having to move around outside of their own villages. And third, in rural Bangladesh, allowing for delayed payment for goods is socially routine, especially for the types of people deemed vulnerable by the program and in need of these services, whose own incomes are likely to be quite periodic and sparse. Not being allowed by the program to extend social credit was interpreted as anti-social business practice. As a result, these disruptive entrepreneurs found themselves in quite precarious social positions with negative self-esteem and also facing intensified criticisms that were leveled against them by their family and community members. Looking at how money and resources flow in a disruptive entrepreneurship model is also a good starting point for trying to understand how the model shifts the nature of social and other dependencies. The primary obstacle women encountered was the imposition of a firewall between business and personal and family use in terms of how money is and is not allowed to flow. The vast majority of them had entered into this program precisely in order to earn money to support their families. But now they were being told that they must use all income not just to reinvest in and grow their businesses, but more crucially, to service the more important obligation of repaying their loans. So a small note about these loans. Do not think for a moment that women's entrepreneurship empowerment programs, which are steered by this ethos of disruptive innovation and market-driven development, would ever be permitted to run on grants, donations, or project cycles. No, these must be business models at the level of the program, not just at the level of the individual women's new enterprises. 
And so in order to be scalable and sustainable, they relied on debt investment. The loan each woman was required to take on was about $1,000 or very ballpark, maybe 20 months of wages in the kinds of labor that their family members or neighbors tended to have. When they heard they would be extended that size of loan, first they were terrified, but then many of them had some pretty big ideas for what could be done with it. Shilpi, for instance, said, I'd give that money to my father and together we could make a real business rearing cattle to sell for good margins before Eid celebrations. Instead, the women were all required to purchase the machines, so meaning the laptop, modem, blood pressure cuff, blood glucometer, weight scale, bicycle, and so on, required to be an information and technology entrepreneur in this program. The loan also had to be used to pay the trainers for delivering all of these trainings and to hand over the first of what would be an annual license fee upward to the organization. So what this means is, because participation required a debt-based investment that they would forever be servicing, they were now locked into this imperative for constant business growth in order not only to cover their own business costs, but also to sustain the operations of the organization that trained them. Because all profits now had to flow upward and out, women were unable to, fill, to fulfill their aspirations to support their families. And worse, the looming debt generated tremendous anxiety and accusations from family members. Many women began to feel disconnected socially, torn as they were between feelings of altruism, but also their need to earn by selling things to their community members. At the same time, they now had to rely on this organization to provide business inputs and training and legitimacy. One woman lamented, when I couldn't pay regularly, the organization would create pressure. I worked three years like this, but I never felt comfortable doing it. My income was gradually decreasing. They promised they would help us when we needed, but they didn't. I suffered a lot in the process of repaying the debt. They shouldn't have put the pressure of this big loan on my shoulders. Another woman, Moni, um, her father told her every day, you've done something to harm us all. You've brought shame and ruin to this family. And one of Jackie Bassett's interlocutors wrote accurately, I think we were a business for them where they have won and vulnerable girls like us have lost. So I'm now going to situate these experiences of being a disruptive entrepreneur against experiences of more ordinary entrepreneurship, where women develop businesses and small trading activities more on their own terms. When I refer to ordinary entrepreneurship, I just mean any new businesses started by women who do, who do so on their own initiative and in ways that are more congruent with their values and relationships. It's what Grace Muller refers to as spontaneous entrepreneurship, to refer to non-institutionalized entrepreneurial work that happens outside of programmed activities um, and, and other programmed kind of initiatives. And what Jackie Bassett calls um, synchronous entrepreneurship, which is in keeping with the women's social situatedness and their desire for recognition through an ethical form of self-making, to quote Jackie. So when ordinary entrepreneurs talked about what success looked like for them in terms of what they were aiming for or what they had already achieved, it was always framed in social and relational terms. Ingredients of this included offering quality goods in a socially appropriate way, achieving social standing and recognition, not needing to rely upon anyone for continued running of the business, but instead being in a position for others to rely upon her, fulfilling community needs often through a vocabulary of service and doing all of this with integrity and good business sense, where good business sense was a social knowledge, gaining trust among customers, for instance, by respecting people's irregular incomes and offering delayed payment. The types of businesses women started on their own usually began with expanding on an existing or aspirational skill, one that didn't lead to people automatically questioning their virtue or their moral standing. 
Etty's example is a good one. Uh, she says, I can cut and sew clothes in any design. I can make an outfit just by looking at the design at a glance. That's how much I'm into cutting and sewing. The people of the village appreciate me for this skill. Similarly, Janat says, at first I was making my own children's clothes. Then when the people of my village saw that I could make a good dress, they gradually let me make their clothes too. By doing this, I could earn three or 4,000 taka per month and I could earn seven or 8,000 during two Eid times. Then I could help my parents. Many times we did not have food in our house and then I would give my money to buy food. Then we all ate together. That's how I used to help my family. Other very common trading activities included rearing small livestock, cooking food often to sell out of a male relative's shop in the market, tutoring young students, uh, weaving textiles, uh, or stitching kids' school uniforms. A bit further from the mold included businesses like opening a beauty shop or a fashion showroom. And these latter examples actually remind us not to make the mistake of assuming that ordinary entrepreneurship is easy for women. On the contrary, it was still very often an arena of cultural struggle where women felt they continuously had to negotiate and justify almost every step they took. There was a lot of obstacle in my work, says one woman, Sanchita. Some family members did not agree with my work. Neighbors, relatives, nobody wanted me to do these things. Many people would say, the age of this girl is increasing, who will marry her? She travels many places with many men. This girl is not lawful, so no one will marry her. People still say a lot. How would I explain to them, a girl can do business and take care of a family also. Just like a girl can work outside, she can also fulfill a mother's responsibility in the house. They will not understand though. Or, as a woman entrepreneur, Yasmin tells us, there are some obstacles that almost all of us have to suffer. All the household chores are still there, but I have to manage my beauty parlor and train my staff, meaning I have to spend a lot of time outside. Then I have to come home and work again without taking rest. Besides, the work of the parlor is not considered honorable. Even after being so educated, I still have to listen to many people's criticisms. There are many religious obligations. In the case of parlors, some of the work of the parlor is seen as haram, meaning forbidden or sinful. This is, of course, a big problem. All the girls in our service sector have to face these issues. Even after all this, there's a feeling of peace that I've been able to create an identity of my own as one of the greatest women. Once in a while, um, the endless struggles and justifications do lead to wins for, for women. Rena tells us, there were a lot of obstacles in my work. For example, when I wanted to open a shop in the town, um, the market committee members told me that they won't let me do it. They said that no girl here will be able to open a shop. I didn't leave until finally they agreed. They had a condition that we will let you open a shop, but we will watch your movements for a month. If everything's fine, then you can continue. I agreed to their condition and opened my clothing showroom. I had the shop for three years, but not one person could say her behavior is not good. Those who stopped me from giving me the store started praising me because I've made them respect me. So a lot of writing about entrepreneurship comes from disciplinary traditions of viewing entrepreneurship solely through an individual lens or through the perspectives of and methodological individualism. But as I hope the cases today have started to make clear, it's absolutely crucial to also pay attention to the social relationships that entrepreneurs are embedded in and which are dynamically changing around them. Not only are women's strategies of entrepreneurship rooted in kinship, but they're also embedded in expectations about appropriate exchange relations, as I've touched on previously, um, being able to work with community members in ways that are congruent with how local economies work. The idioms of cultural value that women describe themselves with also indicate the relational nature of personal attributes. Pride in being self-reliant, for instance, referred to the ability to fulfill family obligations and increase one's social standing within and for the family. 
as Paige Chisholm found, financial self-reliance was discussed through the lens of the social and the relational affordances of money, rather than um, being purely about economic spending capacity. Established was another descriptor that Chisholm regularly encountered, which referred to social standing. Being established implies new hierarchical status positions where higher status is dependent on women's capacity to provide and being sought out by others. Being in a position to help others with money for education or tutoring, to be able to give gifts or spend for holidays, and looking after less well-off family members was incredibly important. As uh, one woman, Charmin, explains about her sense of responsibility for the family, I could not study due to lackings in the family, but I will keep a vigilant eye so that my brothers and sisters do not drop out. I will bear my siblings' educational expenses. I am proud to be able to fulfill those responsibilities. And finally, the idea of being known by a single name seems to sum up how entrepreneurs' sense of identity and social status are entangled. In Bangladesh, women are often referred to relationally, so um, as elder brother's wife or so-and-so's mother, for instance. And so it's with extra pride that women such as Lippi here report things like, I don't have to say my identity. Everyone knows me as Lippi Appa. If anyone has a problem, everyone finds me. My, familiar, my familiarity is not only in my neighborhood, but more or less all the people in the whole union know me. I like it when everyone calls me Lippi Appa because I have been able to create confidence in people's minds about me by working. Or as Moina says, everyone now knows me as Moina Trader. Wherever I go, I think of myself as a business person and tell people I do this kind of work. So in sum, the aspirational model of good ethical behavior as an entrepreneur is that of the generous provider embedded in kinship relations and working with the community in ways that have clear social and cultural value. And all of that is a very different kind of realigning of dependencies than we saw with the disruptive entrepreneur model. In terms of money and resource flows, women often grew their businesses incrementally and then um, often off the back of activities that they were already doing. And so they did not require large capital investments from the beginning. In some cases, a brother or a mother helped out by buying a woman a sewing machine, for instance, which either was a much appreciated gift or which would be repaid flexibly as trading income started to flow back through these kinship avenues anyway. Women found themselves often in their same webs of obligation as before, but now reversed and also expanded. Um, so I wanted to read an example of what, uh, what, what one woman, Nur Jahan, said, um, because she's worth quoting at length. She says, I used to have to ask for rickshaw money every morning in order to get to college. I also had some personal expenses. I began to feel small. At, this, uh, at the same time, um, I worried about my studies, um, the lack of my freedom, the mounting expenses, and my husband's incapacity to earn. I kept looking for a way to earn a living. No one wanted to take care of the expenses. When I realized that I had to take matters in my own hands, I started tutoring to run the expenses. At that time, I used to watch motivational videos of native English speakers for learning spoken English. I came to know about the word entrepreneur at the time. I was determined to choose this as my profession. I asked seven students if they'd be willing to work part-time as English teachers, but we needed a place to give our service. We thought about renting a shop, but my family didn't agree. Besides, such a thing needed investment. My husband wasn't successful in getting a stable job or business, although he tried very hard. So I told my father-in-law that the family would not be able to serve this way, and I asked for his help. He promised that he would try his best, but only on the condition that I would take all the responsibility of my family. I thought, am I not doing that already? <laughs> so finally, entrepreneurs, um, very often talk about how motivated they are to be uh, role models to other women and to help them find their way. 
Nusrat says, I feel blessed to be an entrepreneur. Because of this, I'm able to provide financial support to my family and also a social change is taking place. Seeing my work encourage, some other girls in the village have started a clothing business um, and are earning profit. Um, and so there are many examples of women who are um, achieving success in their own businesses and then helping other women um, by speaking to their families, helping them go to market um, and making sure that they have a foothold on their business skills and, um, and providing support along the way. The anthropologist Frederick Barth was interested in entrepreneurial action in the broader context of the social change in which um, such action plays a part. So what is the kind of social change that emerges or is possible from these different forms of entrepreneurship? Of course, we're dealing with the time frame here that's less than a decade, but there are still some shorter term observations that can still be made. In disruptive entrepreneurship, we see radical shakeups of social life and challenges to social norms and gendered hierarchies and inequalities. Um, but these have mainly backfired. They've seemed to prove sustainable when they seek to pluck women out of their social webs and the backlash these entrepreneurs have faced generate negative exemplars that hinder the entrepreneurial efforts of other women. In ordinary entrepreneurship, by contrast, we see more of an incremental, slow disruption. And it tells us that we should not dismiss roles that women already feel comfortable in, just because we think that they are not radical enough to overturn gendered hierarchies overnight. Instead, we should look to how women increase their own power and respect and subtly shift relations around them in ways that gain them support and recognition. These cases remind us that agency and cultural tradition are not mutually exclusive, nor are they fixed, and that agency does exist within these relations of dependence. One of Hannah Geary's interlocutors, for instance, recounts how her father opposed the idea of her possessing a mobile phone to use for her business, and how she used gentle tactics like playing her father's favorite songs on her phone to win him over. Ordinary entrepreneurship uh, has also provided a, a new and growing set of realistic exemplars where women head their households or possess strong voices within them. The kind of analysis that um, I'm presenting here um, might be confused with a rejection of markets and of entrepreneurship and their role in social progress and upward mobility. But the critique of entrepreneurship models in development isn't a critique of markets or entrepreneurship writ large. Women engage with different types of markets all the time for sporadic exchanges and also more established enterprises. Markets are often quite central to women's projects of self-worth and identity and a way of sustaining their vital relationships. But we need to focus on the aspects and forms of entrepreneurship that women themselves value the most and not those forms valued by distant people. And finally, ethnographic comparison allows us to perceive wide variation in entrepreneurial experience, where more abstract attempts to identify what an entrepreneur is can quickly become stymied by such variation. Ethnography allows us to bring issues like gender, class, caste, age, geography, and privilege, and so on back into these conversations. All right, I'll leave it there for now. Um, I'm looking forward to hearing all your questions and comments, and thank you very much once again for having me. Yeah, thank you very much to Dr. Huang for the fascinating presentations. I really have learned a lot from the talk and yeah, I have also read the book. So yeah, it is, I've learned a great deal from it. Thank you very much. So now, yeah, the floor is open. If you have any questions, just type the questions in the Q&A box and I will read it on your behalf.
Yeah, we have one questions from um, PH uh, Herman Hermansen. Uh, looking back at one of the first national female entrepreneurships initiative in Bangladesh, uh, the Grandman's Phone Telephone Ladies. To what extent do you find do your findings and insights reflect the impacts this program has had on their lives? Uh, yeah, uh, Julie, would you like to uh, answer these questions? Uh, you can also see it on the Q and A box. Yeah, thank you. It's it's a great question. Um, it's a very interesting one. Um, I did not study the Grameen Phone ladies um, directly, but many of the women that I did work with had in the past been Grameen Phone ladies or their mothers or, or aunts or other relatives had. Um, and so they, they did have some commentary about it. Um, I think it, it was a it was a mixed bag um, from what they said um, because it was uh, it was a new technology but it was a familiar technology and it also was um, very quickly in high demand um, from people in the village and you know so for instance if if um, family members had migrant laborers uh, working in Dhaka and garments factories or even abroad um, then it was often quite difficult to find ways to communicate with them very quickly. Uh, but when Grameen phone ladies um, it had this technology that they could bring into their villages, um, then it increased the, you know, the ability of people to communicate with each other. And so the, the, that strong demand helped legitimize this as an entrepreneurial activity of those women. Um, there were still, of course, many questions about whether they should be doing this or, you know, whether, you know, instead a brother should be taking over the business. Um, but I think it was the kind of the cultural acceptance the, um, that helped um, it be more OK for um, for these women to carry on. Uh, this project was, as I understand, quite short lived because mobile phones especially very cheap ones that were accessible to people in rural areas on low incomes um, became quite prevalent across Bangladesh. And then that basically eliminated the, um, the need for a landline service. So I'm just gonna, um, there's a follow up question about demand being a key factor in local acceptance. Yes, um, it, it is a large factor. It's not the only factor, um, but it is one significant one um, in the sense that if it's a radically new offering that people don't understand necessarily the need for. Um, so, for example, the, the women that I worked with were, were trained to provide services like um, right to information access. Um, so this was a new law that was introduced in Bangladesh where uh, any organization, government, um, ministry, or um, kind of civil service organization had to provide um, uh, responses to requests for information within a time limited period. Um, and these women entrepreneurs were trained to go around collecting questions that then could be asked. So, for example, uh, why uh, or how many people have been allocated the uh, the stipends for um, low-income people to access uh, subsidized food. Um, how many of those cards have been distributed in this village and why have this list of people not been included on that list? So um, it's kind of an attempt to reduce corruption and bring you know resources back into the hands of people who need it um, and who are the intended beneficiaries um, to, to reduce the kind of corruption or leakages along the, the pathway. Um, of the resource flows. Um, but pe rural people simply had no interest in sitting around trying to think of questions that they could ask of their local organizations or, or local um, union leaders. Um, and so women just really struggled to make a business out of this. Um, but telephones, um, either in the old days with, with the landlines and Grameen's program, uh, or nowadays, uh, you know, many of these women are selling the credit recharge cards for mobile phone airtime. Um, those are in high demand and convenient 
uh, and so that those kinds of initiatives are, are often good for increasing um, the acceptance of women's entrepreneurial activity. Thanks for the great questions. Yeah, thank you, Julie. And the next question is from Eola. Um, yeah, she said, and I quote, um, did you have a chance to look at women entrepreneurs across different organizations? Yeah, she is curious, uh, were some organizations better than the others at taking into consideration the women's own needs and priorities? For example, social networks, uh, ethical behaviors, et cetera. Laura, thank you. That's a great question. Um, I did, yes. In the time that I was in uh, rural Bangladesh, I spent most of my time in two different locations and looking at all of the organizations that uh, worked with women entrepreneurs in those areas. Um, I won't name any of them, but there were uh, three or four major ones uh, that all had different business models, different types of funding streams. Um, different kind of baskets of products and services that they wanted the women to sell, different kind of training orientations um, and different kind of levels of support that they provided the women. Um, the ones that were more focused on this idea of disruptive innovation and um, scalable, sustainable business models were the ones that were the least supportive of uh, the challenges that women faced while trying to enact these projects. Um, by contrast, there were a few that were still able to um, work with this older um, style of NGO um, funding that's reliant on, on donations um, and kind of getting project funding. And they, those staff uh, often spent a lot more time um, traveling around with women, speaking to their families, helping to translate what was um, being expected of the women in their communities and kind of offering that broader sense of legitimacy. Um, and, and those were the ones that had a, a bit better um, uptake in terms of making sure that women felt supported and felt that they were doing something that was um, ethically sound um, in their communities. Thank you. Thank you very much to both of you. And then we have the next questions from Mohammed. Yeah, scalability becomes a prerequisite for business sustainability in the context of globalizations. Was ordinary enterprise in your example able to withstand forces of globalizations for long time business sustainability? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's, that's a good question. Uh, I think I'll approach it from what the kind of primary objectives of these different businesses were with disruptive entrepreneurship programs scalability was certainly one of the major factors that were prioritized by the organizations um, the women were not so interested in scalability they really just wanted the small scale of being able to support their own families and be looked up to in their communities um, and so they, they they didn't care much about growing their businesses to a large size um, and so issues about globalization and kind of um, scale were uh, of less importance. Um, in terms of business sustainability, the biggest challenge recently, of course, has been COVID. Um, with lockdowns and um, people being told to stay in their homes um, and shut down their shops and not go to the market has meant that the majority of these women's businesses have be, have been crippled um, in the past year and a half. Some of them have found ways to work with uh, online marketplaces, um, for instance, selling their products on Facebook marketplaces or having their own websites that they try to um, promote amongst the people that they already were working with, but they found that challenging. Um, and then there's, of course, always the problem of distribution. And, you know, once someone has bought something online, how do you physically get it to them without breaking uh, social distancing rules? Uh, so in, in that sense, uh, globalization has not been kind to women entrepreneurs of any variety. Um, and so that kind of highlights the bigger issue that uh, markets and entrepreneurship are never going to be the solution to development and poverty alleviation because people also need 
the more institutionalized um, support structures that will help them endure through these, uh, these kind of crises. Yeah, thank you very much for the answers. And then we have the next questions from Rasad. Have you observed any resurgence of religious uh, conservatism, especially related to Islamic Puritanism in rural Bangladesh uh, during the time of your fieldwork? Um, yeah, which may handle the progress of this woman engaging in income generations, uh, gen generations activities. I have not actually. Um, it's an interesting question. Uh, and it's, of course, one that it seems to be highlighted quite a bit in the foreign media. Um, I did not encounter any of these instances of um, religious conservatism um, on the uptick. Um, even uh, sending children to madrasas, madrasas for education as opposed to NGO or government schools um, was not seen as um, a resurgence of religious conservatism. Um, it was just one of the many different forms of education that were available to young people. And that also didn't seem to hinder the women that came out of those schools um, from trying out their own entrepreneurial ventures as well. Um, in, my, in my experience, um, Islam in Bangladesh is much more um, kind of a cultural way of being um, in a kind of syncretic values driven way and, and less um, the kinds of Britainism that we may see um, highlighted in the media. Thank you. Yeah, the next questions from Elin Lee. Um, could the entrepreneurship programs and critically the depths attached to them to an extent uh, be interpreted as a ways of control, women's emancipations in Bangladesh? Thank you. That's, that's a wonderful question. Um, I would point you in the direction of Lamia Karim's book, Microfinance and its Discontents. It's a wonderful book. She goes in depth into the practice of institutional microfinance and the ways that they're framed as women's empowerment initiatives, um, but they rely on um, technologies like um, social collateral and women's peer pressure groups um, and the, this concept of, of shame and honor to, uh, to get their repayments. So rather than in, in, a, you know, in a bank loan, maybe you have a, a house mortgage or a work contract that you can put up as collateral to, to assure the bank that you'll be able to repay your loan. In microfinance, instead of that kind of financial or asset-based collateral, what they rely upon is uh, women's shame <laughs> and the, the, the social technology of shaming women who don't repay, um, which often destroys um, social relationships and families. And you know, many women have felt pressured to flee to work in, in Dhaka because of the shame of having defaulted on the loan. Um, so yeah, uh, Lamia Kareem's book is, is wonderful and it, it tackles exactly this issue about how microfinance has been used as a technology of control over women's behavior. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, is there any other questions from the floor? If not, I will take the advantage uh, uh, of, or, or, I mean, of being the host of this uh, webinar to ask, also ask the questions. Uh, yeah, I mean, thank you so much, I mean, Julie, for the wonderful presentations. And yeah, I've learned a lot from your very in-depth ethnography, especially you are very skilled, that, I mean, you're very skilled to capture the entanglement of all these kind of institutions, actors, agencies, uh, I mean, to tell us a very complex stories about what's going on there in rural Bangladesh. So we cannot take for granted like uh, such terms as development, uh, social enterprise as it is, but rather we should really have an ethnographic and better understanding on how, what, that, how, what, that, what, that, what these kind of terms means. I mean, in the local and the translocal context, which is really important. 
like I mean to understand uh the 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 core issues that the women have been facing when they're trying to uh be uh self uh make entrepreneurs. And I have several questions, but maybe I would like to start with one that is quite historical and anthropological, which is um I'm wondering if you have any uh, data or materials to materials to tell us about um, uh, the term, if there is such a term, entrepreneurs in the local language and, or in the local society before uh, those uh, ideas uh, about social enterprise and women empowerment coming from outside, uh, I mean, started like, I mean, so I'm, I was wondering if there is any indigenous like ideas about entrepreneurs uh, right before um, uh, the enterings of global capitals and the global ideas of social enterprise, because I mean, we also need to have a reference point, right, to see what kinds of things have been transformed in this particular rural uh, Bangladesh uh, context. So yeah, if you have something to say about it, that would be uh, wonderful. Yeah, thank you. That's a, that's a really great question. Um, and interestingly, most of these women would not use the word entrepreneur um, as in the English word um, or any kind of um, parallel in in Bangla. So I guess the closest might be udukta, um, which means entrepreneur. But women rarely use this word to describe themselves, even in the disruptive entrepreneurship programs. Um, they would employ a very flexible array of vocabulary to describe what they were doing, usually um, to try to gain acceptance in any particular context that they might find themselves in. Um, so when they were trying to um, convince their family members or, you know, neighbors that this was an okay thing that they were doing, that there was some prestige involved, uh, they might say, um, I'm doing NGO work or I'm doing service. So things that have you know a long history of providing good resources to communities, they would align themselves with that kind of language. But then maybe so someone didn't want to pay for the service. Then the, the women entrepreneurs often said, oh no, I'm, I'm doing business. Um, I'm doing business, I'm a business person. You need to pay me. I'm not getting a salary from an NGO to do this. I rely on you know, payment for these products that I myself have purchased. Um, so they, they, you know, use different words to describe their own activities that were usually not anything related to entrepreneur. Um, and all of this was part of the kind of relational work that's involved in um, just trying to make the activities that they were doing um, seem acceptable. <laughs> Yeah, thank you. That is really, really helpful I mean, for me to understand uh, more about the ethnographic materials. And we have a follow-up questions from Eola. Um, did you come across any instance of this particular entrepreneurs working together to negotiate for better arrangement? Or are they really, are they really very much solitary uh, workers? Yeah, that's a really interesting question because were in disruptive entrepreneurship programs, they were often um, encouraged to be solitary workers, um, and they were even pitted against one each other, one against one another in competition. So the the organizations might say, um, you know, those who made the most sales in this month would um, be awarded, you know, a new phone, for instance. Um, and then, you know, the one who got the new phone then was the object of envy and criticism by all of the other women entrepreneurs in that area. Um, and there were there were so many other kind of um, uh, initiatives that the organization undertook to try to get them to embrace the spirit of competition and individualism and every woman for herself. Um, but uh, in in kind of the day to day work, the entrepreneurs often did band together and help each other out, which um, and displayed a lot of behaviors that baffled the, the organization. So, for instance, instead of everyone going out and providing, you know, the service um, by themselves in each of their own areas, they would all go to one woman's area and set of villages and they would all 
provide her service um, and kind of as a mob <laughs> um, approach potential customers and all at once explain to them why this is a good thing and you know look we're all doing this and um, you know trying to kind of trying to mobilize the the group um, the groupness behind um, the the individual entrepreneur who was working in that area to show that there was a broader social acceptance around her. Um, and so all of those other women whose area um, was elsewhere, they didn't earn anything that day. Um, but then they knew that, you know, in a, in a future day, then they might have the whole group rallying behind them. Um, the women sometimes went on strike against the, the, the daily plan of the broader organization um, if they didn't like the terms. Um, but unfortunately, because the organization had so much control over the supply chain of the products that they were selling um, and access to training and so on, that they could just refuse to pay them or, you know, you know, refute, like cut them off from um, their sources of supply. Um, so unfortunately, most of these attempts to band together were um, kind of institutionally discouraged. Thank you very much. I think we still have one minute. Uh, is there any final questions from the floor? If not, I think uh, yeah, it's already almost the end of uh, the, the webinar time. So yeah, once again, thank you so much for uh, Julie, Dr. Julie Wang for her wonderful talk, as well as for her very engaging response to all the questions. And also, uh, uh, thank you so much for all of you who have spent time joining us today in this webinar. And then we will have several events uh, uh, at the Child Center in the coming weeks as well. So do please uh, uh, check out our webpage and our Twitter to, to follow up our next events and, 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 and next webinar as well. Yeah, once again, uh, thank you so much to all of you who have joined us today. And, um, Thank you so much for having me. Yeah. Thank you, Judy. And yeah, I wish all of you have a good day. And have a nice week.